Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to today's BIC stream session, Leopard Diaries, the Rosette in India. The leopard is perhaps one of the world's most beautiful creatures. It is social but solitary, inconspicuous but significant in numbers, large but ubiquitous, and does not fit any of the pigeonhole of cat, large, cat, large cat conservation. In India, the leopard is a poster boy for the fight to preserve wildlife, but in many countries, it faces either ecological or local extinction. A worrying phenomenon, given that these cats carry out important ecosystem services that have not been fully understood yet. Dr. Sanjay Gubbi shares in this talk his work of a decade of field research and unravels the complex and ambivalent world of leopards that is sometimes marked by horrifying tension between the humankind and the natural world. The relation of the species with the ecosystem, the landscape it survives in, the people and the society is extremely important to be understood. All this work is recorded in Dr. Gubi's book, a first of its kind book on leopards from India, Leopard Diaries, the Rosette in India, which is now available online as well as at your favorite brick and mortar bookstore. We have uh, today consulting editor and conservationist Sejal Mehta in conversation with Dr. Gubi post his lecture. The speaker's bios uh, will appear in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And through the session, if you have any questions, observations, or comments to share with the speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A box also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And with that, I hand it over to Sejal for opening comments. Thank you so much, Lekha. Um, welcome, everyone. This is a very special evening. Um, I was actually reading um, Sanjay's book uh, over the last month, and we've had uh, some conversations about it. And yes, of course, while um, the book is very rich in terms of his in-depth research uh, about leopards and um, you know days on the field, and it's very visually powerful um, in its prose. But what is also really evident with this book is a lifetime spent in the wild. So as we know that nothing exists in isolation, it's not like a leopard any, any animal you know, lives by itself in a forest. There are people around it. There are other animals around it. There is an ecosystem that it thrives in. There are ecosystems where it fights in. So there are these small little, there are people that fight for it. And there are people that are you know, in conflict with it. So all of these little nuances uh, find their way into the book. And I think that is what makes, uh, makes it such a rich resource of insight, not just into the leopard and its life, but also what we, I think, um, sitting a bit far away from the forests, need to understand about behavior, about livelihoods, about life itself. And um, I have enjoyed reading it. I have many questions for him. Uh, Sanjay, of course, is sitting in a beautiful, beautiful setting. I think he wins all points for the background. Uh, if there is any contest, he's won them all. He's giving us intense FOMO while we are all under lockdown in our cities. <laughs> Sanjay is sitting in this beautiful forest. So um, what? how we're going to do this is I'm going to pass this on to um, Dr. Gubi to give his presentation. And after that, uh, he and I will have a chat about the book. Like I said, I have many questions and I'm quite excited to ask them. What everyone can do is start putting in questions in the chat box and uh, we'll try and leave it into the conversation. Um, so yeah. Uh, Dr. Gubi, over to you. Thank you, Sejal. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, BIC, and everyone who has joined uh, for this evening. And I'm very glad to um, tell that uh, this is one of the best places to uh, actually sit and do a presentation on leopards because I'm sitting in a place which has one of the best leopard habitats in the country and best large cat habitats in the country. And um, I've been coming into these kinds of places in especially this place for the last 30, 35, 30 odd years. And um, this book is what um, is a culmination of a lot of things, not just on our research work on leopards. So um, 
all of you like carnivores i am sure you know people love carnivores and then um, especially if you're talking about large carnivores people are very fascinated about it uh, in the world there are about 245 species of terrestrial carnivores because there are also carnivores that are found in the sea the pinnipeds um, and uh, they they play a huge role in the ecosystem they are very important to for the functioning of the ecosystem itself they also bring in a lot of economic benefits for several countries you know especially countries like some of the countries in africa they depend on tourism uh, wildlife tourism especially when there are large cats in those places and they're also a, a very important part of human culture for example, this picture shows Lord Mahadeshwara, very close to where I'm sitting, including this place. There are a lot of deities and I mean, a lot of uh, followers of Lord Mahadeshwara, whose carrier itself is the tiger. So there's a, a deep cultural relationship with large carnivores as well. Uh, in India, for example, we have 58 carnivores, uh, which includes tigers, lions, leopards, snow leopards, wolves, and um, all the way down to civets and other animals. And um, if we specifically talk about carnivores, uh, uh, you know, uh, they all, especially the felids, they all originated from this uh, one species called the styrophilis about 11 million years ago. So if you see at the, at the evolutionary chain here, uh, styrophilis is, is up here 11 million years ago and the panthera, genus panthera, they, they were the first to branch out in the evolutionary cycle about 6.4 million years ago you know this genus panthera has all the marvelous cats we all adore and one of these uh, one of the uh, one of these species was the leopard you know um, i won't get into the evolutionary history of leopards but i'll just give you a quick background the panthera pardus sickenbergi which was found about 600000 years was supposed to be about 25 times larger than the current day uh, leopard and uh, you will be uh, you'll be it will be interesting for you to know that it was actually feeding on homo erectus and homo sapiens and also hoisting homo sapiens and homo erectus like the modern day leopard does with a deer with a samba deer or with any other prey species to avoid uh, conspecific predators trying to um, you know take away the kill from it the modern day leopard evolved about 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 million years ago in Africa and then slowly radiated uh, to into Asia about 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 million years ago. Of course, you know, as I said earlier, you know, large carnivores and humans have a very uh, close relationship, sometimes negative, sometimes positive. And this is one of the first paleolithic arts you can see in the world about um, leopards, one of the oldest human art depict, depiction of leopard found in a cave in southeastern France along the Ardèche River. And initially they thought it was about seven, 12 to 17 or 17,000, uh, 17 to 21,000 years old, but radio dating and radiocarbon found out that it was actually about 35,000 years old. And you can see the, the hyenas, the cave hyena, cave lion and other animals also depicted in this cave art in southeastern France. So I'll just uh, go back, get back now into modern day uh, felid um, uh, genus uh, 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 um, and explain, you know, the genus Panthera is subdivided into genus Panthera and then uh, uh, genus Neophilus. Uh, the genus Panthera has five uh, species, the snow leopard, leopard, tiger, and the lion and the jaguar, while the Neophilus has the mainland clouded leopard and the Sunda clouded leopard. The major difference between uh, these large cats is that some leopards can roar and some leopards can only purr. For example, snow leopard and the clouded leopards can only purr. They cannot um, roar. That's the that's the, uh, the speciality of these animals. For example, wow. 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 So the tiger. Wow. 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 Similarly, even a leopard roll. And this is made possible because these cats have a very specific uh, anatomical advantage on their part because their, their hired bone is modified, they are very flexible, so it allows them to roar while the hired bone in most of the other cat species are not flexible, not very, uh, they're, uh, they're, uh, 
um, the flexibility of the other the, these four big cats. Hence, they can only purr but not cannot roar. While these roaring cats can both purr and actually roar. But one thing which is very common even in this country is that despite all the science, despite all the publications and, and uh, writings that come up in the media, we still have a very fundamental, fundamentally cause. Open up a newspaper, if there's a story about a leopard, it's very likely that they have a picture of a cheetah on it. Or they would put a picture of leopard and write that a cheetah was caught or a cheetah was found near a village. But if you see these three pictures, you know, the body coat patterns of these three uh, felids, uh, which are very similar. The top one is, of course, the leopard. The middle one, which is the cheetah, which has a rounded spot. The leopard is called as the, the, the spots on the leopard is called as very romantically called as rosettes, actually. And the jaguar has rosettes, but spots on it. Very rarely you find a spot in the middle of a rosette in leopards. We do find them, but very, very rarely. So these are clearly the different uh, uh, patterns on the on these three cat species, which are generally mistaken by common man, by the media and a lot of other people. And coming specifically to leopards, we currently have uh, science or genetics has uh, segregated into nine subspecies of leopards, uh, right from the Persian leopard, the Indian leopard, Amur leopard. So they're, they're found in a variety of habitats, right from uh, the, the areas, the, the Russian forest where the Amur leopard is found a critically endangered species. Only about 100 uh, individuals are found in the Russian Far East, where the temperature goes down to minus 40, 45 degrees. And you could also have leopards in Arabian, you know, the, the, the Persian leopard and the Arabian leopard, which live in temperature, which goes up to plus 50 degree uh, centigrade. And that's also the kind of habitat variability you find these leopards in, in, in tundra area, in areas which has snow and in deserts, these animals survive in both these kinds of habitats. And there's, of course, you know, a very uh, interesting um, uh, leopard, the, the Bagheera of the uh, Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. Who doesn't know Bagheera? Who doesn't know uh, Rudyard Kipling? Um, so this, this is the black leopard, the black panther it's generally called. It's a melanistic form of a leopard, that's all. Um, there's a, there's a, a better pigmentation or higher uh, black pigmentation both in the hair and in the fur about this leopard and uh, actually it's not just the leopards or the panthers which are found in this form out of the 38 species uh, under felidae about 17 species are found in this form as well so you'll uh, find black caracals you'll also find black jungle cat and other um, other species and black leopards are found in these countries which i have listed out except south africa there's uh, not a uh, evidence-based uh, recording about their presence in south africa otherwise india sri lanka nepal bhutan in indonesia only in the island of java and ethiopia Currently, it's not found, but historically, it was found, the black leopard, and of course, Kenya. So this forms about 11% of the global distribution range of the leopards itself. There's another um, uh, form of leopard, the erythristic leopard, the, the, which is popularly called as the strawberry leopard. I hope people can hear the uh, Francolins calling at the back. Nice and loud. <laughs> okay, this is the erythric, uh, erythrism form of uh, leopards, where the red pigmentation is very high, and this this is also called as the strawberry leopard, or some people call it call it as the actual pink panther, the real pink, pink panther. And it's found only has been documented only twice in South Africa, once in 2012 and in again in 2019. And leopards uh, in the history of mankind have had a very special place. You know, the pharaohs in Egypt, um, uh, they loved leopards. You know, the, they were importing leopards from Ethiopia is what uh, has been written in history books. Some of their god goddesses, the goddess of justice, you know, uh, Madfet and Sesha, they all had leopard skin on their as their as part of their aprons or their dressing. And of course, Tatung Hamu, the one of those uh, uh, youngest uh, pharaohs, very famous pharaoh, when his um, uh, when uh, when his body was excavated, uh, mummy was excavated. They also found this beautiful art form on which he was actually standing on a black leopard. So it, it goes very well, you know, there were uh, uh, historians have found uh, uh, burial grounds of a lot of animals in, in uh, Egypt, where there were also leopards from the times of the pharaohs. 
and of course you know the uh, new, new new york metropolitan museum and a museum in basel in switzerland have this jasper uh, leopard headed jasper they were used as pawns to play old uh, board games of uh, in egypt and of course in india you know lord shiva wears uh, leopard skin as part of his attire you'll also see uh, modern day saints are also sitting on leopard skin supposed to be holy and um, of course even during historical times for example during chandragupta maurya's the, the arthashastra uh, talks about uh, uh, you know preserving leopard you know there was a lot of regulation on uh, hunting of leopards during his time he brought in a lot of such wildlife friendly laws during his time including for uh, for elephants and if you look at southeast asia there's a lot of um, other interesting historical events about, which is uh, built around leopards and tigers large cats uh, there are specific terminologies even in in uh, uh, in indonesia and in malaysia uh, about to call leopards um, including black leopards uh, as early as as recently as 19th and early 20th century they had something called as rampog makan which was played you know it was it was a ritual uh, immediately after ramzan ramadan uh, and they would bring out these large cats in wooden boxes and they would let out tigers and leopards and people would surround as you would see in the pictures with spears and would kill these animals as a sport and it was thought to be a bad omen if they had actually missed the animal and if the animal missed out of the or escaped out of the ring so uh, <clears throat> coming back to modern day uh, the the modern day terminology of leopard is supposed to be of greek origin leon means lion and pardo means male leopard so but it's also got some people say it's also has a origin in sanskrit praduku and vipin vipin actually means uh, an animal with uh, spots like islands so there's a lot of controversy um, or a lot of discussions which says which is the actual origin of uh, the word leopard the indian sub continent of the nine subspecies as the panthera pardus fusca is protected under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act giving it uh, the highest protection in this country uh, internationally it's uh, by the international union for conservation of nature and natural resources they have categorized it under vulnerable and after vulnerable it becomes it gets into endangered status we hope that the leopard does not um, uh, get uplisted into the next category and um, it was a fashion icon actually in the 60s and 70s to have a unfortunately it was a fashion icon jacqueline kennedy who toured india and pakistan in the 60s early 60s actually wore a leopard fur coat and it went viral and uh, it went so viral that about it's estimated about 250000 leopards were killed uh, just to make fur coats like everybody wanted to follow jacqueline kennedy's uh, uh, attire and her fashion uh, she became a fashion icon uh, it it was so bad that the actual designer uh, who was of italian origin uh, he was he uh, shown here in the in the slide he felt so bad about it i believe you know he writes that he spent rest of his life repenting about the attire he created for jacqueline kennedy so right from jacqueline kennedy even within india in the earlier early 20th century 19th century it was very fashionable for our kings and also for the british to go and hunt tigers and leopards and so many other animals so on the left of your screen you'll see a, 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 a letter written to a indian gentleman by a by a british gentleman and if you read the line which is underlined in red it says he is inviting this indian indian gentleman to work for him the the british man saying uh, but there is excellent shikar to to be had here better than mari kanave he says so he's inviting the indian gentleman to come and work for him and he's enticing with him with better shikar you know you can come and hunt there's a lot of opportunities to shikar so it was so much in in daily lives of people at that time and right from them to president mobutu of zaire which is currently called as the democratic republic of congo who always wore a leopard uh, skin hat or uh, uh, two they, then when um, uh, leopard print became a very big fashion when textile was manufactured in a big manner you know you know it became came up in a industrial scale people started to wear leopard print clothing you know beyond you know i'm sure a lot of you people know the american singer and uh, it went viral even today a lot of people People love clothing. That's how not just the culture, but also in fashion. And uh, the modern-day leopard, as you can see in this. Uh, most 
distributed all across the world on several parts of the world except in the north northern zone the green uh, sorry the uh, dark gray patch shows the historical distribution of leopard and the green patches polygon shows the current distribution of leopards so actually uh, leopards currently survive only in 25 to 37% of their historic range the biggest loss has been loss has been with panthera pardus fusca uh, panthera pardus pardus which is the uh, subspecies in uh, africa and panthera pardus fusca which is a uh, indian uh, leopard subspecies found in parts of pakistan india nepal bhutan and bangladesh and the uh, subspecies panthera pardus saxicolor which is found in the middle east these animals have lost 90% of their 97% of their historic range these three subspecies uh, within india you will see the uh, the the variation for the uh, indian subspecies it really has shrunk and it survives in only about 3% of its actual historic range and as you see leopards you know you see a picture on the right hand side very nice lush green forest uh, nice canopy these are the evergreen forest and you'll find leopards there and on the left hand side you will see the dry deciduous forest which will become completely dry during summers and you will find leopards there you'll also find leopards in this kind of habitat which are called as a woodland savanna uh, don't confuse it that these are degraded habitat they are actually natural habitats with a lot of open space um, grasslands and then tree growth very sparsely distributed these are called woodland savannas and you'll find leopards here you'll also find leopards in these kind of habitats the rocky outcrops mostly found in the deccan plateau one of the best habitats for leopards actually leopards sloth bears and hyenas and if anybody can uh, point at uh, see if they can two see two large mammals in this picture i'll i'll uh, be very happy or i can show you there's a leopard on the top and there's a sloth bear and these rocky habitats rocky outcrops are extremely important for these two species and the third species being the striped hyena found in india and sometimes you'll also see uh, find leopards in agricultural habitats man made habitats like maize fields arecanut plantations coffee plantation sugarcane fields but they are found there but you should be aware also aware that maize fields and sugarcane fields are all dynamic habitats so not one of the best optimal habitats for leopards as well and you'll also find them in, in these intermediate natural habitats and human habitations together where you find this mixture of these two uh, pictures and uh, i'll show you a few uh, pictures from camera traps we had put up on the outskirts of bangalore this is a picture of a, a community uh, like a gated community on the outskirts of bangalore with lot of green space and the hills you see at the background is called as the banergata national park uh, which is about 260 square kilometers and all these forests are outside the national parks limits and here the the these are the 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 at the ground pictures of that gated community you will see this gated community and you'll see older people walking going for their morning walk or their evening walks and then after everything quietens down on the same path at the same locations you'll start seeing these large cats walking across and um, they survive in a, a, a extraordinary kind of uh, variation in habitats but also their diet is very varied you know you'll see this large um, adult uh, male leopard picking up a bandicoot walking away uh, this leopard is carrying a monkey but this leopard of similar size is carrying a cheetah which is about 100 kg 120 kg at times if it's a large cheetah so the the diet is also very wide for leopards you know if you consider only the mammalian species it's estimated they eat about 110 million uh, 110 mammalian species and it would extend to 200 species included birds reptiles everything and of course they also feed on livestock domestic animals domestic dogs um, and it the, and it can survive on these uh, animals but it can survive on smaller animals like the bandicoot i showed you uh, only for a shorter period it can't completely survive on bandicoots forever because because of its body size it requires about 4 4.5 kg of meat every day so if it has to eat 5 kg of meat it has to catch tens of bandicoots and it all its energy would be expended just catching bandicoots so please don't get mistaken that they can survive on bandicoots or fishes it can be as varied as this but it certainly needs good meat on a daily basis 
and why do what do leopards do in an ecological setting you know they certainly have an ecological role you know there's a terminology called as trophic cascade um, uh, in ecological terminologies which means if you remove a certain species there's a lot of domino effect on the entire ecosystem for example this these animals these ungulates you are seeing are grassland species so there is good experiments that happened in africa in gorongoso national park where leopards and lions went extinct in a particular national park and uh, uh, certain herbivores which were basically forest herbivores started to get into uh, grassland habitat so they brought in vegetation which were mostly forest vegetation into the grasslands and the grasslands started to disappear because the leopards and lions were not there which were keeping these forested animals in the forest which were very afraid to come into grasslands because it was much more open so that's a big role the leopards play or large carnivores play they also control smaller um, smaller carnivores like the caracal in in some parts of the world or it could be the jungle cat it could be the indian fox so many other smaller uh, carnivores called as the meso carnivores um, because they are they are they control their population either by fear or by predation by killing them you know this ensures that the prey species these animals prey on are also at a level which which can be managed by the ecosystem there's a nice uh, study in in bombay uh, by a by a researcher who said leopards also help in controlling rabies you know uh, he estimated the researcher uh, brakoswick brakox brakoswicki sorry about my pronunciation he estimated that um, about 90 lives are uh, uh, are um, saved in bombay by because of leopards which were preying on domestic dogs so leopards have this ecological role but in india when you think of leopards you mostly think of um, british time hunters like jim corbett and the books he has written the manitos of rudraprayag manitos of kumaun and so many other books or kenneth anderson from south india that's what you normally uh, hear about leopards and um, in the literature but we have moved ahead from jim corbett's time and kenneth anderson's time but the first question everybody would ask who is interested in wildlife who would go on a safari to a wildlife habitat first question they would ask is how many tigers are there in an area or how many elephants similarly first question that would come into your mind and which is largely unanswered was unanswered till now was how many leopards are there if you had the asked a question how many tigers were there we had an answer Uh, for a large part of the latter part of 90s but about leopards we had rarely had very uh, little answer that's where i started to understand try to understand where can we find leopards and how many leopards are there for that we had a very simple tool but a very important tool um leopards have natural marking the rosette on their body so that is very very useful to actually estimate leopards number it's not just on leopards it could be on giraffes it could be on several reptiles tigers have their uh, stripe patterns and leopards have the rosette patterns and we went out and set out lot of automatic cameras which are triggered by motions by any animal and you get a host of uh, animals and including leopards so if you see these two pictures you will see the rosette pattern on this leopard and this leopard are completely different so you get um, uh, if you set up a lot of camera traps in a, in the in your study area you get hundreds and hundreds of pictures including tens and tens of pictures of leopards so you get all these leopard uh, pictures and you identify individuals but later you have also missed some leopards which have not appeared in front of your camera trap uh, because of detection issues you know because the leopards are shy or we didn't place camera traps in every part of the study area or for so many other reasons that's when you use stat statistical methodologies to actually estimate what proportion of animals uh, did we capture on camera traps and then you can estimate the uh, prob uh, estimate the uh, abundance or the total number of animals in a particular area and we did this across several states i mean several sites in karnataka state in southern india we did worked in protected areas we worked in non protected areas i'm just putting up a list of some of the protected areas and non protected areas we worked uh, protected area is basically national parks or wildlife sanctuaries or tiger reserves or conservation reserves and non protected areas can be reserve forests a uh, state forest and also forests which have or leopard habitats which have not been protected under uh, wildlife laws or conservation laws like the 
the rocky outcrops I was showing you. Many of these rocky outcrops do not get protected under law, but they're very important habitats for lepers. So if I showed you the density, the number of animals per unit area uh, of leopards in protected area, they seem to be quite stable. You know, this is um, A would be uh, Banergata National Park, B would be BRT Tiger Reserve, and C would be Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. I've also put the size of those areas in the bracket in parenthesis. They look very similar, uh, very stable with uh, standard deviation, which are quite favorable, you know, quite decent standard deviation. But if you looked at non-protected areas, the number of animals were there, but the, the variation was very, very large. For example, in uh, in Bukapatna Wildlife, you know, uh, in Bukapatna in Tumku district, uh, 172 square kilometers, the density was very low. But a similar sized area like Sandur, uh, the density is very high, comparably very, very high for so many reasons. Similarly, the abundance, the number of animals in that area seem to be very varied in non-protected area compared to protected areas. And what we saw, it was very dependent on two issues, the availability of prey and the amount of uh, illegal hunting of prey species that was happening. So we clearly saw the leopard numbers would go up if wild prey was low, but domestic prey was higher, you would have higher number of uh, leopards, but the wild prey reduced if the number of poaching incidences uh, went up in a particular area. So human pressure certainly had an impact, both positive and negative on leopard numbers. Both domestic prey and wild prey had a key role, but it is always useful to have better wild prey because once you have domestic prey as their, um, as their have food, then the issue of human wildlife conflict starts off. And we also got a lot of other interesting aspects, you know, about the behavior of leopards. Uh, for example, leopards, when the leopard mate, you know, they also are doing so many interesting things which we didn't know earlier. Uh, these are pictures of one particular female leopard, which is towards you on the foreground, uh, called CU18. And uh, uh, we get uh, them, all these animals in camera trap. This is the MML's wildlife sanctuary, the white polygon. And one morning we got the picture of MML 23, which is a male leopard. All the leopards will, which will be in black boxes are male leopards and the leopards in white boxes will be female. So we found this male leopard in our camera trap uh, and with it was another female leopard called MML 20. And five days later, we see MML 20 with another female MML 18. So what's happening? So is MML 20 flirting? But a few days later, not a few days, about three or four days later, we get MML 18, the female leopard, but this time with MML 17, 71, which is a male leopard. So here MML 18 was with MML 20. In a few days, she shifted from 18, uh, from 20 to 71. Similarly, um, MML, oops, sorry, MML, 23, uh, sorry, 20 also shifted pairs, you know. So these are actually the females may be changing mates, the males, either to, um, to uh, protect her young ones if she already had young ones, or they're uh, perhaps, you know, doing, uh, you know, she's carrying, you know, they're polyandrous, this is certainly polyandry, but she's doing convenience polyandry because in one particular female, CU18, we saw her, we captured her since 2014 until 2020. We are getting her in the camera trap for eight years now, but she was also flirting around with another male or she was moving around with another male, even when she had young cubs. Uh, subadult cubs. So normally the understanding is they won't come to estrus until she has uh, the cubs wean out from the mother. So this is certainly perhaps convenience polyandry. She wanted to protect her cubs uh, from a uh, intruding male. So she was uh, moving around with another uh, male even when she had cubs. So this is about counting leopards, but if you want to also understand where are leopards found, are they found in, where are they found in higher numbers and lower numbers, then we had to actually compare leopards in their natural habitats, in protected habitats, non-protected habitats, and in other areas as well. So we did use a tool called as occupancy surveys spread across 24,000 square kilometers, which is larger than many of the countries in the world. And we walked for about 2,800 kilometers, which would have landed me from Bangalore to Manali if I'd actually walked on a straight line and counted leopard signs and their prey signs, but we were also documenting what kind of habitat uh, leopards were found in, what was the threat the leopards were facing, was it quarrying, mining, we were recording all these things. And what we found was, if you see on this curve, 
this is the proportion of leopard habitat within a grid we were walking you know these kind of square shaped boxes the grids and we would see the more leopard signs we were finding where there was more natural habitat so if you see the occupancy uh, probability of occupancy from 0 to 1 you see uh, when there is more natural habitat you had the probability of leopard occupancy uh, getting closer to 1 of course in natural habitats uh, the probability was very very close to 1 the highest probability of occupancy was in natural habitats and also in areas which had large wild prey so it's very clear that nature though leopards survive in human dominated landscapes in human modified landscapes like agricultural fields like arachnid arachnid uh, uh, groves or coffee plantation sugarcane fields natural habitat and wild prey are still extremely important for this study so, but what happens is when you have leopards in human dominated landscape, there's a huge demand to capture and translocate them. So we looked at how many leopards were captured in, in Karnataka and we found out 357 leopards being captured in Karnataka over a period of about seven, eight years and translocated to so many different uh, areas. You know, you see these bars, this map and the blue dot uh, suggest the capture location and the star suggests the uh, release location and the thickness of the line shows you how many leopards were captured and translocated to an area and the guide you'll see the uh, one leopard or two to five leopards six to ten leopards uh, so they were being translocated to different areas including seasonal translocations and this was not good for leopards or it was not good for people as well. So the government brought in guidelines against translocation in April 2011. So we wanted to test if guidelines brought in uh, laws would stop actually these kinds of activities, especially capture and translocation of leopards. So we looked at how many leopards were captured per month and translocated before the guidelines were brought and how many leopards were uh, captured and translocated after the guidelines were brought in. And we sort of stark reality, the actual guidelines made no difference. There were more leopards captured and translocated after the guidelines were brought in. So the issue was the outreach. So we can do a lot of laws, we can do a lot of guidelines, but until and unless we do the outreach and reach to the real kind of people, the real stakeholders, on ground uh, government officers and communities, the laws won't change much of the attitudes and actually uh, it won't, it may change attitudes, but it's not going to change behavior. So we are also looking at what would happen to some of these leopards. So we, we collared a few leopards, we put radio collars on some of these leopards which were translocated. And one of the beautiful stories which I've also written in the book uh, was named as Benki my, uh, by my son, uh, who was only four, four years old. And I don't know why he called it as Benki, but he called it as Benki. And true to the, his name, he was a really like a fire. Benki had very nice, unique rosette patterns, including rosettes like you will see on uh, on jaguars like a dot in in between the rosette and he was walking around in the translocated location and we found that he was translocated for about 85 kilometers away and then he immediately settled in its in his uh, new location uh, you know uh, we monitored him for over um, uh, 90 days no sorry 100, uh, 144 days and uh, we found him uh, to be surviving even as he was translocated in January 2014 and we continue to uh, get his locations even after his collar fell down. So this is the picture when he was when he had the collar on the camera trap and this is a picture when his collar had fallen down, fallen off and uh, four years after he was translocated. So we found out that uh, Benki, a large male leopard, about four to five to six years old, uh, settled completely in the translocated area. He moved about 7.5 to 15.88 kilometers in a day. And he had a home range for about 141 square kilometers, a very large home range, as big as a city like Mysore, if you know Mysore city. But another female, another leopard, which was translocated uh, by about 40 kilometers, a female uh, for about four, uh, aged about five years again, it was translocated from the southern part of Nagarole, the northern part of Nagarole from agricultural landscape and translocated. And she immediately left her translocated location and started moving out. Unfortunately, after a few days, uh, she was poisoned and she killed uh, because she went and ate livestock. So people had put uh, poison into the goat it, she had eaten and she was unfortunately killed. Um, so we also looked at movement patterns. So animals, uh, this is the time during the day and night. 
so animals which were in uh, natural habitats were moving both during day and night times while animals which were largely in human dominated landscapes mostly were active during no- uh, night times you know you see it 12 o'clock in the night till about 8 o'clock in the night it's morning it's very active then it goes into a lull and again starts after 4 5 you know 7 8 in the evening and becomes active again very similar pattern for animals which were in human dominated landscapes and unfortunately these days uh, leopards though they are found in human dominated landscape there's a lot of pressure which have been put in put on these animals uh, this is a, a video amateur video which was taken near mysore city in a hillock called chamundi uh, hills chamundi beta a leopard was sitting on a road and somebody made a video of this leopard and it went viral and there was a huge outcry from people that this leopard has to be captured because it is dangerous to human and you'll see in the picture that the leopard is actually very shy it's not it's uh, it's not dangerous to anybody but unfortunately uh, this is uh, we had got this leopard on our camera trap which was this beautiful male leopard which is very nice um, uh, about 7 to 8 years old um, and uh, uh, we could identify because of the rosette pattern on the body this is a screen grab from the video and this is a picture from our camera trap you'll easily see the uh, 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 rosette patterns which you can anybody can match this this one and this one they're all very similar you can i mean the same uh, unfortunately it, it people had got it captured because it was uh, close to human habitation there was a lot of pressure it went into a into a shop uh, which was selling bananas actually a wholesale shop which was selling banana and the animal unfortunately was captured so uh, though leopards and leopard ecology is very important for the conservation what is also very important is society what is very important it conservation of wildlife is not just about ecology it's not just about science there's so many other factors like economics about societal attitudes towards conservation and to wildlife and so many uh, other aspects which put pressure on conservation on wildlife especially on leopards we still have a lot of pressure on them like i had told you earlier on their on their wild prey being hunted on a regular basis especially outside protected areas their natural habitats like these rocky outcrops being mined and quarried uh, in a big manner especially again especially outside the natural habitats and uh, leopards because of, also because of their ability to survive in human dominated landscapes have so many other threats um, unlike its larger cousin the tiger there lot of leopards killed on the on the uh, on the streets uh, because they're run over by vehicles they're killed by snares because the snares are set on farm edges to capture uh, wild prey to stop wild prey to come into the farm fields or poaching and uh, retaliatory retaliatory killing of leopards and one of the biggest problems for leopard and we have to um solve this issue is human leopard conflict you know leopards are preying on livestock uh, leopards uh, occasionally hurting people or killing people and the future of conservation in this country especially for conflict prone species like leopards elephants and tigers will and sloth bears will certainly hinge on the aspect how much conflict can we tolerate and how much conflict can we reduce to tolerable limits until and unless we solve this problem of human wildlife conflict the future of conflict prone species will be very very difficult in this country so the society has a huge role um, both urban communities and rural communities of course rural communities are very benevolent in this country um, and they have shown huge tolerance to uh, survive with wildlife and uh, the survival of wildlife in this country will hinge continued uh, tolerance levels thank you very much and now i have uh, i'm open to questions okay uh, sanjay thank you that was uh, that was superb and um, i like how it traveled through history and came to where we are today um there are some questions already in the chat box i'm going to try and just uh, incorporate them and i think there are lots of people who want to also know how they can work um around conservation so we'll come to those uh sanjay let me just start with um, something that you yourself have expressed some surprise at in uh, interviews that i've seen after this book after you've written this book and um, this is a cat the leopard is a cat that we actually live alongside uh, far more than we live alongside other animals uh, there are stories about it there are uh, people who come into conflict with it there are stories of coexistence uh, but there are uh, this is probably one of the few um 
nature communication in terms of popular writing uh, that has come out uh, you know about leopards whereas tigers have so many books and we have so much access to that kind of beautiful anecdotes from the forest why do you think that is i mean considering it is such a animal that is so around us why do you think that is i think always you know humans are fascinated especially the modern man has been fascinated with lesser numbers you know more elusiveness and shyness if you see uh, or even the fascination that uh, if you say there are only 20 donkeys perhaps people would be more interested to watch these animals of course you know i have i have no envy and uh, i'm not jealous tiger is certainly a beautiful animal and it caught the attention of people a long time you know especially uh, people who are into the writing who are writing skills scholarly work both scholarly work and more importantly it's a flagship species you know it's a charismatic species so you draw the attention of conservationists and draw the attention of policy makers using tigers as a carriage because it's so charismatic and uh, I can't go to a policy maker right you know with a frog and say I want to save this frog but you go with the tiger you know they're much more willing to listen to you and uh, uh, and willing to listen to you what the, the arguments you make I think that's where in that way particular race the leopard became the poor cousin of the tiger and that's when we also lost a lot of opportunities to get literature on leopard despite the fact uh, that india has so many leopards one of the countries which where the long term future of leopard is perhaps more secure and i wish there's more literature coming up on leopards especially popular literature and why should we even today read only british literature about indian leopards you know yes. i strongly feel we should have more and more indians writing not just about leopards but all other species and about nature um, more and a lot of Indian writers are coming up these days and I hope um, and of course the younger community will surely be much more active than us. Well that's actually hope for, we hope for that as well because something you said is so important right that you write a write something on a frog they might not be uh, look at it but I hope that changes and that there are books written about uh, amphibians and reptiles and everything uh, tiny as well and marine animals so I think that's something that <laughs> You see, I already did there. <laughs> so I hope that there is much more written about um, features that are not uh, read about. But um, I think there is a question that kind of coincides, so it's not really about nature communication. But uh, Nisha has asked that, um, how does nature leopard conservation compare with tiger conservation in India? Do leopards face more challenges as compared to tigers? Yes, certainly. You know, uh, the last slide I showed all the different kind of challenges leopards um, face. You know, you don't see a lot of leopards being snared in India. Um, uh, sorry, tigers being snared, but while you see a lot of snares, and I have a recent paper which is coming up. We looked at the number of snares that happened. I mean, number of leopards that got killed by snares, especially, and we saw enormous number of leopards, especially being killed in human dominated landscapes. So we were looking at the various covariates. And one of the things which starkly came out was the number of snaring incidents of leopards shot up after the human density crossed over about 225 people per square kilometers. So we have leopards certainly in uh, highly human dominated landscapes, but the number of threats they face is also going to be much larger. Number of leopards being killed by, uh, by vehicular, uh, mortal, uh, vehicular accidents or because of snaring or because of retaliatory killing and also the number of animals which will be captured and translocated. Uh, it's also because of poor understanding about the animal itself and poor outreach. You know, um, we need to do more outreach, develop tolerance levels. But of course, this other aspect of how the society is changing, you know, our culture is changing, the economics is changing, everything is changing. Similarly, tolerance to survive with non-human forms is also changing. Right. You know, of course, the issue of biophobia has always been there. You know, people are afraid about lizards to rats or uh, to elephants. But, you know, there is some amount of tolerance which was benevolent in this country, which uh, helped our wildlife species to survive. I think with changing economics, that is also changing a little bit. And of course, you know, we have also failed in bringing down the human wildlife conflict issues. So if leopards are eating up livestock and people are losing their livelihoods on a daily basis, they're not going to, we can't ask them to be toler tolerant towards leopards. We can't ask them to coexist with leopards. You know, this is a very wrong phenomena. We always say coexistence, coexistence. But whom are you asking to coexist? Absolutely. That's very important. Correct. Uh, in that sense, I think this kind of... Um outreach which also goes out to readers who are not necessarily because 
that's also very important right you cannot i mean like you say coexistence is very tough when an animal lives this close yeah and is uh, actually coming into like it's literally you know you go downstairs and there might be a threat so it's very easy for us to sit here and say uh, and by us i mean the larger public you know the researchers that are working there that you know you tell them to coexist but it's it's actually a very different ball game called ball game on the ground absolutely absolutely in this type of communication then uh sanjay i was curious to know that when you say when you do nature communication or at this level like a book for example which is going out to a, a largely urban uh, population which also is familiar with uh, conflict in the way that we uh, understand it from newspapers uh and you had you have information that is now spanning decades and uh, a lot of data and some of it that we saw and you presented it in, in a very easy to understand manner which you also done in the book but when there is such a big data dump uh what do you distill when you talk to us about and that's something that is in the book how do you distill information that should go out what do you want us as readers to take away from this, from the book that you have written see for a common man i want them to be um, motivated about wildlife conservation mm. i want younger people to think you know the google goosebumps to come up i hope i can do some justice with the book uh but i don't end up there you know i'm also i also write in kannada my native my mother tongue that's very strong for me that's my my more main goal more than english i've written quite a few books in kannada already because i get you know messages i get phone calls people come and talk to me from distant villages remote villages that's when i really feel you know something has gone out and i have people who have come from real rural backgrounds who walk up to me and say you know we have got interested in wildlife because we used to see them but it gave a different perspective when we read your book you know before this book i wrote a book called shalege banda chirte mattu itara kathagalu which is a in english it would mean the leopard which came to the school and other stories and a lot of readers are from rural areas you know that is what i am trying to the forest watcher you know the frontline store of the forest department yes. the villagers the gram panchayat members they they are the ones who actually make a lot of decision for these animals indirectly and we need that is where we need to reach actually you actually that makes a it's a recurring theme in the book where you talk about the foot soldiers as you say and uh, there is also a certain and because there is so much talk of living together um there have been places where you have mentioned where things worked yeah in in terms of people that you worked with and people on the ground that you worked with uh people who had uh, you know their eyes and ears to the ground when you could not possibly be there all the time so can you talk a little bit about that kind of uh you know kind of cohesive attempt uh, and i come from a place of probably a little uh, less um it's not that familiar for i don't know where most of our listeners are from bombay for example okay has uh, this entire uh, community now of people who Uh, there is a citizen group uh, there are police uh, involved there are um, researchers they're all pushing together government officials as well is that something that can be a templated thing that can work everywhere or you wouldn't think that could be possible it works in certain urban settings it's uh, it works in areas which has a population which are economically you know well off kind of you know i have been i started off with wildlife conservation in my high school days so then uh, you start becoming very you know you think you have to do this awareness for other people okay so we used to go on a motor you know on a bicycle and then graduated into a moped going a slide with a slide projector to villages in my in my area and showing them pictures of leopards and elephant and telling people that they have to conserve this and people would shout back at us it was not that everybody would watch a leopard beautiful leopard picture and said wow how nice it is what wonderful they would say do you know what how much loss i go through because of leopards how much loss we go through because of wild pigs etc etc this is where i learned human wildlife conflict i didn't learn it in a school i didn't learn it in university i learned it on ground by people shouting at me and you started to see wildlife from their perspective and there it is difficult it's not easy even to this day but if you are able to convince them work with them it's it's the final success for wildlife conservation i think in in my opinion it's very good to have this kind of urban crowd but it's also very important that we encourage and bring out in the rural areas where most of the uh, wildlife survives and people have to coexist with uh wildlife and that is where we can make a huge difference and the country has made a huge difference because we as urbanites 
enjoy the benefits of conservation because tiger number goes up elephant number goes up people goes on go on safaris they watch discovery channel they watch ott platforms on on wildlife in africa but the real cost of conservation is borne by them because elephants go and crop raid you know leopards and tigers go and pick up their livestock that is where conservation really needs to happen actually there was a picture sanjay in your presentation uh, with a man uh, holding a, holding a rifle Mm -hmm. was that uh, is that the anecdote you talk about in the book about ganesh uh, the the poacher that was uh, that was uh, caught is that uh, was that a uh, this picture is a different one but uh, ganesh... can you talk a little about that because like you said camera traps and uh, photos on ground really show us a lot about the behavior of animals as you said but it yeah. also did something very different in in that case yeah and that was powerful as well so can you just uh, tell the listeners a bit about that incident yeah it's a very important question sajal because it's also about ethical issues so we don't go and give away pictures of everything you know people carrying firewood we don't share those images with people though in some places it may be called as illegal but we shouldn't do it you know but there's also an ethics for us as conservationists as researchers there's also fine balance we need to play between ethics for wildlife and ethics for people so you have pictures of animal of people carrying guns you know some people might question can you share that pictures because it is unethical to share a picture of a person without his or her permission to the authorities but my ethics of wildlife conservation also triggers in you know i also need to be fair to wildlife you know that is where i have come up from from a wildlife background everything today i am because is because of wildlife you know the, the reason bic has invited me is because of wildlife so i can't give away my ethics but that part of my ethics of wildlife conservation as well so in on a very judgmental basis we need to take a judgment a very valued judged uh, fairly judged decision to share such pictures to authorities of course that picture which we got in kaveri wildlife sanctuary we shared it with authorities and they tracked him down and it was found out that he was ganesha actually a big elephant poacher he has poached a lot of elephants and some people even call him as the next virappan so it would have been very unfair if i had not actually shared that picture with uh, with uh, authorities and there would be more elephants being killed by him so this is a very fine balance you know uh, in one of the recent reviews on a, on the book people called it very unethical that we shared this image of uh, of its person to authorities but there's also the ethics to wildlife conservation mm -hmm. all the money i i know the, the the salaries i get is because of wildlife so i can't just let away one part of ethics and hold on to only one part of ethics it's also important that as a conservationist i also need to be fair towards wildlife that's true thank you for that answer um, because i i saw the photo and i remembered um, uh, you know what you had said in the book as well um something that and i i had a question about benki as well but you kind of answered that okay. i think what the uh, uh, what was important is that the reason that benki was you did you wrote about it is the translocation process yeah and to understand what happens after an animal is um, translocated into another forest and what happens and does it then and there's one question here as well on that that does an animal usually stick to it's um when it's translocated does it return or does it usually stay and this is one case study where we found that it's kind of but uh, would that be the exception or the norm no we don't we, our sample sizes are very very small from india you know perhaps this kind of experiments are done only on about 10 animals you know, all together you know perhaps five in maharashtra five in karnataka where translocated animals were actually put on radio collars and monitored so the, it's a very mixed pack mixed bag results we have we can't make any kind of conclusions i can't say all leopards that will be translocated will um, remain in their translocated location or all animals which are translocated will move out i think it also depends on the age of the animal the gender or the sex of the animal and the prey availability in the translocated location also we have not tried soft release which means you bring in an animal to an area you know make it accustomed without human much human interference and then release it into the wild we are not we have been only trying on hard releases just bring in an animal and release it so all these factors may can make a big difference in africa they do translocation of wildlife almost on a daily basis rhinos elephants lions lot of other animals so in india it's become a very touchy issue not to try and understand these subjects we bring in a popular narrative and we try to stick to it 
Mm. I think we should be very much more open. Science is not just about being rigid. It's about openness. It is about also being us being proved wrong. Mm. That is only then the science progresses. So I think we need more sample sizes and more experiments to actually see what happens to this question. I think in my opinion, currently I could be wrong. Uh, the answer is still, um, uh, the question is still uh, par partially answered. That also brings me to the uh, adaptability of the um, creature itself. Uh, you've got data from so many places and not just in India, worldwide, right? Yeah. And you also talked about how it's because it also has different, it has a very varied prey base, like it can eat many things and hence it is able to survive in, in different uh, habitats. But does the habitat itself, uh, what is it anything about its make other than what it likes to eat that makes it easy for this animal to be you know, in a city, in a jungle, in a desert, in a mountainous landscape, it, it pretty much seems to be uh, something that is okay anywhere, resilient anywhere. It's, what is it about its make that allows it that other cats don't have? The body size. Number one is body size. You know, a leopard, the, the Indian leopard, the, the uh, heaviest animal would be about 70 kgs. So the meat, uh, the food requirement it has is smaller compared to other large carnivores like the tiger or the lion. The Asiatic lion or the tiger. The tiger can go up to 250 kgs. Then it will need a um, uh, meat of about um, uh, about 50 kgs every week. Hmm. A leopard may require only about 20 kgs. So that is one aspect which can make it survive in different uh, habitats. Um, but its preferred prey size is about 23 kgs, which is almost the same size of a goat or a sheep. That's why it gets into conflict. It, if it does not get in wild prey, it suddenly can easily shift into domestic prey. It's also very easy for the leopard to kill a goat or a, a sheep and sustain on it, or even a domestic dog, you know, uh, 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 stray dog or a dog basically. So it survive on these things. It's also got this body condition, um, uh, uh, body size, which completely makes the difference between this animal. But adaptability to habitat is completely a different uh, aspect altogether. But uh, uh, tigers are also habitat generalists. You know, they can survive in uh, Russia. They can also survive in Rantambor, which is 50 degrees. Similarly, elephants are a habitat generalists. They survive in Namibian deserts. They survive in lush green forests in Southeast Asia. So these ha habitat generalists can adapt in different places but not habitat specialists. So if you look at Great Indian Bustard, India as a country, we are not doing very well with habitat specialist species. Look at cheetah. We lost cheetah a long time ago. So we can boast that we are good with wildlife conservation, but if you start uh, partitioning them as habitat generalists and habitat uh, specialists, we have lost a lot of habitat specialists. Great Indian Bustard, only about 100, 150 is what the estimates today are being told it's a habitat specialist so we have been thinking only you know when you were earlier saying about tigers and leopards we only think conservation is about one particular species but there are species which need different kind of approaches so we have i think we need to do some course correction about this particular issue and you've actually in the book also have discussed how uh, when you try to do something for one species as well and sometimes it's misguided yeah. So, for example, for leopards as well, when you try and, you know, have agricultural places and you kind of change the landscape, the wolves lose out. Yeah. And uh, there is a problem there then because then it affects the entire ecosystem. So, in that sense, I think uh, course correction in that sense, what would you, is just more knowledge and more scientific, um, you know, understanding uh, help in this manner? How can it, uh, and here's where somebody has said, what are the, uh, you know, ways in which um, conflict can be avoided but I'm actually trying to think it's not just about the conflict it's about when you do something for one animal and something else kind of gets out of whack so how does one do this uh, you know in a, in a cohesive manner is there any I mean I'm, I'm sure there are no hard answers yet yeah. but are there any visions any, any, any thought do you have a vision towards that see one thing is a good understanding of natural history you know we are we are a subject we deal with a subject where your foot has to be on the ground unfortunately these days even for professional conservationists it has become more to do with um, uh, computers and statistics and modeling and those kinds of things but i'll tell you very honestly from the time i have been walking in this forest right from small forest patches to large tiger reserves until and unless you have an understanding of the ecosystem how an animal is related to a tree 
how a tree is related to a butterfly you miss the points then if you don't understand this a very complex relationships you may not understand everything but if you get a good understanding of natural history what's the relation between a tree and a butterfly or a tree and uh, uh, of an or an elephant and an elephant and a particular plant species you will miss you will not miss a lot of things then it gets into your system it gets into your thinking process that you will see a lot of things for example as i've written in the book an area in in the in my place where there were a lot of wolves mm-hmm. is now completely devoid of wolf because people went and planted there because it was grassland they thought it was they needed some planting in that area mm-hmm. so there's a lot of you know people think planting trees is very good for environment actually it cannot be very good for environment only if you did the right species at the right place it is good otherwise it's a very wrong thing so in an area which had wolf now doesn't have wolves but we have leopards uh, in an area which had black bucks now we have cheetah coming in mm. so you have to have a good understanding of natural history and the openness to listen to natural history and to say what course correction has to be done and what is a better management plan to that area and then i think it will work well hmm. one thing to... does not fit all yes exactly so i have that i have two more questions of my own and then we'll go to the because there are a fair bit of questions coming in um i would be amiss if i would not ask you about uh, the incident that you have written where you had a personal encounter with the leopard what really stayed with me uh, <laughs> dr gubbi that you said even when the animal was at that uh, distance you found yourself quite mesmerized uh, of course there were other feelings as well it was not that there was no one but oh, you were at that moment also a bit um, you know taken by how powerful this creature is um what have you learned from that uh, from that because you know in theory uh, researchers and you know you think about this day you think that there could be an encounter where you have to but to go through it uh, yourself and then you take away learnings that are very different than what you had before uh could you tell us a little about that see it teaches a lot about uh, our relationship with animals but also the way people look at you it taught me a lot of things what happens before after an accident it was just an accident you know any uh, i don't never blame the animal at all for that uh, issue but we always have this uh, wrong opinion is when you go through human wildlife conflict you're paid a compensation and that's it it's even but it's not like that if you put if i mean if i tell my own experience that was just an incidence but the impact it has on me is a long term impact you know physical impact it had had on me it was very long term it has long drawn to recover it was a long process to recover and we had perhaps were lucky we were in such positions that we were able to afford these kinds of things but imagine a villagers with whom we asked them to coexist who loses a father who loses a mother who loses breadwinners what can what can happen to those families you know people young children are sent to you know just where i am sitting now young children missing their school miss their school because they go, they have to go and uh, protect their crops at night time they have to help their fathers to protect the crop so next morning they cannot go to sleep i mean uh, they cannot go to school because they they have lost their entire night sleep so human wildlife conflict is not just what we see there's a lot more indirect impact and until and unless we empathize and work towards betterment we are not going to do good wildlife conservation in this country and as a personal experience you know the leopard incidents in the bang in in that school in bangalore um uh, everybody remembers the school for some reason and whenever i walk especially the first year after the incidents happened people would even in a in a in a Uh, ola cab or in a uber cab the drivers would you know ask me a question after a minute or two they would say sir do you mind if i ask you a question i said yeah please go ahead they would say sir are you the person in that school <laughs> they would not remember my name but they would remember the name of the school and if i said yes they would say oh as soon as we saw the booking i thought it must be you but we were no i was not sure if i could ask you that question so yes. conflict has very graphic images and that is what remember you know sits in people's head imagine somebody unknown and in a place like a large city if a taxi driver could recognize it was because of the graphic image and leopards bring in those such kind of graphic images it's not just about the animal and the conflict that is when graphic images catches the attention of media and the people unfortunately also i 
also i think uh, and that kind of ties into the last thing i had um, is uh, the empathy you spoke about having experienced it yourself in some way or the other the conversation now that you have with uh, people on the ground probably rural is also you it was always empathetic i'm sure but now there is a lot of level that is added to it where you have been through it in some way yourself and you understand the situation far better than you did but in a larger sense before i pass this on to the chat window um as you know when you do some kind this a similar kind of work for a long time say now it has been decades for you in 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 the wildlife field and somewhere you said right now that we have to be prepared to be wrong we have to learn it's not rigid and we are constantly changing like as writers also we are we, we are we are okay to say oh this was not the conservation story i thought it was i should not probably look at it in the same way how have you led this animal and your tracking of the wilderness um how has that changed what has that changed in you and then i'll pass this on to the chat box but i'd love to know <laughs> i think it's an it's a it it brings in a whole lot of things you know philosophically talking it brings in a change in the in the person who watches these animals there's no better inspiration than watching an animal in its natural settings and you know uh, continuing its daily business without being disturbed by like a, you, when you are on a safari the animals are actually disturbed they are responding to your presence but if you watch animals when they are not disturbed because of your presence there are a lot of uh, uh, things you learn it's the way that these animals love their young ones the the way they take care of their young ones uh, the way they you know uh, hold on to their territories for the reasons why they hold on to the territories and so many other things and also in this school incident you know i saw the leopard's eyes uh, a few i don't know less than centimeters from my eyes and i'll tell you there's no better eye as beautiful as a leopard's eye i'll tell you honestly <laughs> you say that in the book as well and that that's what was so uh, magnificent it's like staring at you in the face at that point yeah and you can know i i'll tell you very honestly they are really powerful i can tell you i heard my bones break the leopard bit through the bones and i'll tell you till then i had not felt the pain of the animal biting me uh, but the, when it bit through the humerus it, i really pain you know felt the pain but i'll tell you it they are very powerful animals don't play around you cannot play around with them <laughs> Uh, that's uh, we would not <laughs> anyway but that's good learning <laughs> as you've now experienced okay i'm going to open the uh vijay ramnath asks uh, there are many cases of leopard deaths by poisoning via snares road and rail accidents is this receiving enough attention from the authorities to what extent are measures being taken to prevent these that's a very good question vijay you know it's not just about authorities which is in your opinion perhaps forest department authorities but as i said earlier it's to do with the development of this country the economy of this country as we need as we need buy more vehicles there are more demand for more roads larger roads wider roads and there will be certainly more roads going through leopard habitats and we we'll lose more leopards unfortunately so economy and growth and development infrastructure development has to also factor in non human life forms like leopards until and unless we really put this into the system when a highway is being planned we need to ensure that it makes way for the uh, animals which are found in these areas until and unless we built in build into these systems we are unfortunately going to see more and more of these and i hope you know uh, we uh, get into a situation where all these uh, factors are built in while they are planned itself i think the recent uh, data on the ipbs um, study also actually puts land use and not so much climate change as the biggest factor for ecological collapse yeah. i think that is something that uh, ties yeah, in you're right sejal actually we don't have a proper uh, land use or zonation we have a house you know all of us have uh, houses and we clearly zonate our houses you know the living room and the bedroom and the puja room and the kitchen you don't go and cook in the kitchen Uh, sorry you don't go and cook in the puja room while you don't go and cook in the living room or in the bedroom while we are not applied the same for the country mm. we are trying to do everything everywhere you know i think we some better thinking is required on these aspects mm. interesting uh rohini asks uh, what is the recent data on leopards injuring or killing humans um i think you know 
there's no uh, combined database this is one problem in this country but i still feel you know leopards kill about 100 people or more than that in the in the, in the country annually is a guesstimate you know please don't hold me for that but i guess more than 100 people 150 people are current, killed in the country because of leopards annually mm -hmm. Um, Rana asks, uh, and this kind of, I think is about, yeah. Sorry, Sajil, there's a very interesting question by Parthi Ben Elango. Is that yes. right? Yes. Can we answer that? That's a very yes. nice question. The cheetahs and leopards. Yeah. They, Parthi Ben says, you know, if there is a different name for leopards and cheetahs in all Indian languages. Yes, if there are actually Parthi Ben, uh, like you rightly say about Sirutai for, uh, uh, in Tamil, Kannada, I learned this word for cheetah in Kannada called Sivangi. It's called Sivangi in Kannada. I learned it when I was very small and I went to a circus with my father. And my father taught me this word called Sivangi. And imagine, he's not from a wildlife background, but he knew what a Sivangi was because we grew up in, uh, he grew up in dry land habitats, dry areas. So I think he had an understanding of what a cheetah was. And he knew the actual terminology for cheetah. And it's different from what it is for a leopard. So Canada has certainly has a different word for cheetahs. Uh, it is called Sivangi, while leopard is a chirte. Or there are so many other uh, forms of uh, uh, names for leopards in Canada as well. So certainly Indian languages have a different uh, word for uh, cheetahs and leopards. Would I be opening a can of worms if I asked about the cheetah? Uh... Any location, or shall we take that? Let me finish the yeah. chat. Off. I'm very curious about that. So Rana asks, and I think this ties into the translocation as or the release and capture. Actually, uh, could the large number of leopards in Sandhu forest be a cause of FD releasing captured leopards into a single forest? How do these external interventions or actions affect the data that is gathered for such statistical analysis on distributions? Right. Thanks, Rana. It's a good question. Uh, uh, that is why long-term monitoring of certain uh, areas is very important. We have been working in some areas on a long term, longer term now. So one area where we work and we have seen this change is Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. The leopard numbers are just increasing. And this year's 2020 numbers is leopard. We started in 2012 in this area. And we were looking at leopard numbers of about 60 to 70. And now we are seeing about 110 leopards in this area. We don't know if it's just a natural increase in their population, but also one of the reasons could be a lot of leopards are brought and released into Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. And that may be an artificial augmentation of leopard numbers in Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. And Rana is asking specifically about an area called Sandur. I'm sure it, it could be one of the possibilities in Sandur as well. So it's very important to understand and gather data on a longer term, not just a snapshot. So for example, a lot of people are saying density of leopards in sugarcane fields are very high. Density is a wrong uh, estimate according to me for leopards because you can uh, leopards are found even in smaller natural habitats or artificial habitats and their numbers can be densities can be four animals per hundred square kilometers which actually means there may be only two or three leopards in an habitat but you have to look at abundance how many leopards are there actual numbers of leopards so density can be a misguiding uh, statistical uh, figure according to me that's a great question Anna. Um, Avijit, that says, um, excellent work, Dr. Sanjay. What is the problem in taking back the captured leopard to original habitat instead of leaving them far away? Are the residents of the gated community near Banagata not worried about their safety? <laughs> Avijit, wonderful, you know. Uh, it all depends, you know, recently, this one particular gated community, which uh, the pictures I showed, they're mostly senior citizens, they're both 60. And initially, they wanted the leopards to be captured. Then we were called in and then we started a slow education process, awareness process to them. And now they allow their leopards in their community. But recently, about two months ago, there was a leopard found in another gated community, in another apartment complex in south of Bangalore. And we were called in. And then people were reckless. They were not even willing to listen to about leopard behavior, about any awareness program. They were just wanted the leopards to be shot very upper class uh, community, either leopard to be shot or captured and taken away. You know, this leopard, this particular habit, I mean, uh, apartment complex was right in the middle of leopard habitat. So all the three sides of this apartment complex was en ensconed by leopard habitat, rocky outcrops. So the leopard would use about 100 meters of their property or whatever they call it, their property to cross from one area to another area. 
and people went hysterical they were unwilling to listen to anyone they were not tolerant about leopards they were mostly upper class uh, people who came from large cities uh, and no tolerance levels at all so it's very diff- different for different kinds of people i should tell in this particular you know moment about an incident about 6 months ago in my hometown in my home district there were six human deaths in an area leopards in arkanet fields arkanet plantations six human deaths including four children and please listen to this this is very gory one of the child 6 year old girl was picked up right in front of the grandparents this was the scenario and then we were monitoring this area we were trying to help authorities and people and uh, when the when this young child i you know the 6 year old girl was picked up the minister called me to the village we went to have a joint meeting and one old lady 60 plus lady got up and said sir all these days the leopards was picking up our livestock and we were fine with it now it's picking up our children please do something and i'm not saying kill the leopard this is what the 60 year old leopard lady said when her own people were killed while this urban people were saying kill that leopard and it had not done no harm no harm so it's very varied how people look at leopards or look at losses actually mm. i was so moved that day when this old lady said do something i'm not saying don't kill the leopard but do something she said mm. that's quite amazing i think they're so it's uh, when you live close to something you have a history i think it's very different than uh, than when you come in contact with it randomly there is also this place in uh, gujarat right with the crocodiles uh, there is yeah. a place in gujarat called charotar where they live in harmony because they know the behavior yeah. and then there is baroda where there is um, immense conflict because there is no understanding of uh, there is no history there is no shared history of knowing how to live with each other no also how much elasticity we have for other things that's Correct. also very important very important uh just to tie into this as well uh, anand asks uh, is there any compensation for livestock damage by leopards is it up to the mark and are people happy with it? happy to know um, what people call it as is excretion or do they they don't actually call it as compensation because they don't pay the actual market value of a loss and um, nowadays at least in karnataka they increase the comp- uh, the excretion value a little bit these days in the recent days in the last one month or so but what is also important is the indirect losses you know like i told you earlier if you lose a livestock tomorrow you can't milk the cow there's no cow to milk and take the uh, milk to the dairy and then every week you get a uh, get some amount from the dairy right so you may get an excretion but for tomorrow you don't have your livelihood going on you have to bring a new cow and then it takes some time to bring it up to the certain levels and then you start milking and take the milk to the dairy and then you start back your livelihood so the indirect impacts of conflict is very serious and the, the 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 losses you go through uh, the indirect losses you go through is also very big of course you know compensation is still not up to the mark in our country mm-hmm. just as there is a rearing of tiger in farms so to speak is there a similar trend around leopards also in countries such as the usa there are many individuals who keep these wild cats as pets or in private zoos how does one counter both of these okay these are two different question in my opinion sejal one is about farming of wildlife mm-hmm. to meet the market demand the other is the pets yeah the other is you know what is kept as pets farming you know there's a huge demand some people think farming can be an answer to conservation issues because crocodiles are farmed and they're killed to make purses or whatever uh, for the mar- to meet the market demand but uh, the there is no data which shows that uh, farming has actually impacted or uh, b- impacted conservation in a positive way so it's a huge demand some people look at it from an economic perspective some people look at it in the other way but we don't have a, a, a we don't have data but some of the data especially from china shows farming does not really bring down the demand on wild animals the, their wild cousins because people still think the wilder the animal is it is better so they do not want to buy farm products but they would like to buy a uh, tiger bone for example from a wild tiger rather than a, a farm tiger of course leopard farms does not exist perhaps it exists in china uh, uh, but it has not brought down the threat on leopards in china as well the second thing was about pets it's certainly wrong to keep these kinds of uh, 
dangerous animal in a, in a small house. Uh, US has more uh, 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 tigers as pets than all the tigers put together in the wild. And you get to hear very horrible stories. It's certainly wrong to have uh, these kinds of animals as pets. I certainly, as a personal opinion, I don't approve it actually. You mentioned about le leopards in India being categorized as vulnerable and threatened. With reports of leopards killed being so frequent, how worried should we be for leopards in India to move into the endangered category? Okay, the vulnerable category is mostly an IUCN category. In India, it's put under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act, which gives it the highest protection. But as it with as is with so many things, things look very nice on paper, but it we lose on implementation. So I think there's a lot of pressure on leopard habitat, natural habitat through quarry, mining, uh, infrastructure development. I'm very worried about it. And also the loss of natural prey for leopard. Yes, leopards will certainly uh, survive on domestic dogs and on other kinds of prey. But I think the situation turns to human wildlife conflict then. I would any day uh, feel it is better that leopard survives on wild prey and some amount of very little, less of uh, uh, domestic prey, actually. Nirmala has asked my question. What are your thoughts on the plans to introduce cheetahs into our forests? How well thought has it been? Thanks for your great work. Uh, madam, you know, uh, it's a lot has been discussed about cheetah reintroduction in, in India. There's two, uh, as with any story, there are two sides to it. Um, you know, people are saying we should bring back cheetahs because it has been the iconic species of grasslands and it will is going to save grasslands. But we also had great Indian bustard, which was an iconic species of grasslands. Did we save grasslands? Did we save the habitat of great Indian bustards? Unfortunately, we did. And uh, I don't know if many people may not know that great Indian bustard was actually initially uh, put as the uh, supposed to proposed as the national bird of India. So we missed even saving our national bird. I hope we don't miss it completely. Uh, but um, you know, I think it's very important that we focus on species which we have, uh, species we are losing, great Indian bustard, so many varieties of birds and reptiles and amphibians which are being lost on a daily basis and we need to focus on those um, and uh, ensure. And also how many cheetahs can you have in this country while the natural habitats is in such small proportions available. It may be good for 8, 10, 20 cheetahs, 30 cheetahs, but they don't become a viable population there. What we need, wildlife conservation is about saving populations of a species. It's not about few individuals in a zoo or only 10 or 20 animals. We need viable populations, hundreds of them. Correct. Absolutely. Uh, what is your advice to wildlife photographers who love leopards like me, who want to do conservation through photos by showcasing coexistence? Your thoughts on con your thoughts about photography, basically wildlife and conservation photography. I mean, after the mid 2000s, I think there's a huge surge in wildlife interest in wildlife photography in in, in, the, in the country. You know, it's a good thing uh, people have access to these kind of big equipment, expensive equipment also have access to uh, areas where they can go and actually take very lovely images of uh, these animals. Um, but what, what it has done, you know, but people will also have to use this uh, pictures, lovely images for saving the species, you know, because that is what brings you, uh, takes you where you're going. It also brings you whatever you are getting out of that particular picture. So you have to be, in my opinion, uh, in my personal opinion, I could be wrong. You know, people can have other opinions about it, that it has to be used to save for the conservation of that species. If you're not using for the conservation of that species, I don't see much value in it. It ends up as a nice um, uh, piece on your, in your living room or in a competition for photography. I'm fully for them. I support photographers, but it has to ultimately end up as something which brings in conservation value for the species. You know, like for example, I say, if any day I retire, if any day I retire from wildlife conservation, I should not look back and think, oh, I spent so many years, so many decades, I got everything from wildlife. Did I actually do anything for wildlife? I want to you know, sleep at peace. You know, I want to feel that I did something for this species which brought in so many things for me. Uh, and I would apply the same for uh, wildlife photography as well. Sanjay, it's also, I think uh, for photographers here, 
I think it's uh, there are you, I mean there are of course many things you can do, but the easiest thing to do, and this is something that I've you know just in the last few years from Marine Life of Mumbai, is that there is this um, the website iNaturalist and websites like that where you can actually put in your photos, and in some way or the other, it's a it's a database of images. Of course, you have to take care of the Creative Commons and all of that, but that I leave to photographers. But if you do upload these on places like this, where there's Indian Biodiversity Portal or iNaturalist. Basically, you're contributing data to something. Like somebody will be able to look at it and use it in some way or the other. So that's one way that photographers can actually put in photos, at least even if they're document shots. You just put it up and you're you're any helping in some way. And also perhaps uh, what is there beyond the lovely image? What's yeah. happening to tigers? What's happening to elephants? You know, I'm very happy. Some of the web portals are also have computations which has conservation themes in them, not just lovely pictures of animals, which I think is a great initiative. And that brings in some amount of empathy for animals from a common man. Uh, I think that's very important uh, to go beyond uh, the, the pretty picture, but also be aware, you know, I'm not uh, making a critic uh, criticism here. I'm just making a positive critique about it, a healthy critic. Uh, imagine tourism has become beyond the reach of common man. I can't afford to go on a safari in a place like Rantambo today. It's very expensive or even in Nagarole. So if a person living next to the forest whose crops are raided by elephants and wild pigs cannot go and see what is behind his backyard, Imagine the kind of unfairness it brings into conservation. As I said, we have to be much more fair towards people uh, who bear the cost of conservation. I think it's very skewed these days. So I, my request is also to analyze what impacts, indirect impacts we have while doing tourism or when we are on safari, are we disturbing the animal? Are we using a lodge which is in, built in a corridor of a wildlife corridor? Or are the lodges where we go and say, or a resort, do they practice wildlife conservation? Do they actually talk about conservation at all? Or do they talk only about pretty animals? Mm -hmm. So all these things can actually play a very important role, um, you know, if you start asking questions for yourself and then later to people. And there are many organizations that actually work in these places now. So if you can actually get in touch with them, and uh, they have programs for villages as well. So I think that would be very, very helpful. Um, inclusiveness, I think, is what probably is the way forward and yeah, not exclusion. Yeah. So, thank you, everyone. for And Sanjay, thank you so much for doing this all the way from Vandipur. And um, thank you, BIC, Lekha, thanks a lot, Ravi, Raghu. And guys, thank you for listening in and uh, hoping that uh, there'll be more conversations like this in the future. Thank so, you very yeah. much. It was wonderful talking to all of you and thanks to BIC and Sejal, thanks to you. Thank as you. Well as hosting. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, guys. Keep safe. Bye. Thank BIC and everybody who was um, online uh, part of this session. And that you, thank you, Dr. Bubi, for this captivating session. No pun intended. If... <laughs> Anyone not already in love with the leopard and, and wildlife uh, before now, I'm sure they are, they are now after this wonderfully detailed, empathetic and balanced approach to wildlife conversation and animal human conflict. Thank you, Sejal, for bringing your intellectual um, uh, expertise uh, and skillful moderation uh, to uh, this session and to make it blossom more than it already was. And thank you everybody for attending, taking this evening, uh, these uh, uh, 90 minutes uh, to be with us and to eat uh, uh, the rosette on the leopard. And hopefully oh. see you again. Where to buy the book? Maybe we can tell people where to get the book. Uh, the book is available. The book is called Leopard Diaries, the rosette in India. It's available online and it is also available on any bookstore that you can walk in now between, I think, 10 and 5 p.m. And, uh, in some cities at least. Uh, and maybe by the time we see all, you will all have read it and we will all have had those goosebumps that Dr. Gubi was hoping for, uh, a snippet of which we've already experienced this evening. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And uh, see you next time.